One of the tragedies of today is that many people, even the highly intellectual, seem to have forgotten. Not what? What's this? What? I don't want, I don't, my picture's not there. No. Somebody's not moving. Okay. The new technology seems now to obsess everyone. They use smartphones, they use computers, but they can't sit down and read a serious book. They complain of being bored. One consequence is that those who produce newspapers and television and radio news programs are now compelled by the demands of their followers, whether readers, listeners or watchers, for news items to be compressed into very small packages. These items must also be made exciting to catch their customers' attention. The result is that no ordinary news item on the television can be given more than a maximum of three minutes. Radio news items are usually even shorter because they don't have pictures to spice them up. Joe Public now expects to be told everything he or she needs to know about contemporary affairs in a very short time or they will change the channel. So they get shallow news for shallow minds. An example is our thinking about the ultra-religious Jews known as Haredim. We automatically assume that the Haredi is anti-Zionist, will not go to the army, and so on. The subject of this evening's lecture is someone who was not in what we think of as the Haredi mold even though he was a distinguished Torah scholar who enjoyed wide recognition as such throughout the Jewish world, and even though he looked the classic Haredi. I came across him by accident while looking for some information, and I looked up his entry in Wikipedia. The, intro the introductory paragraph, as usual, was very short. It read, I'll wait till you get it on the screen. One, two, no more. There it is. It read as you see, Moshe Mordechai Epstein, Epstein it should be, with an H, but we don't do that, 1866 to 1933, was Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Knesset Yisrael in, in Slobodka, In Slobodka, Lithuania, and is recognized as having been one of the leading Talmudists of the 20th century. He is also one of the founders of the city of Khadera. Next to it was a photograph you've already seen. Rav Epstein in his Spodek later in his life. To me, that final sentence, he's also one of, one of the founders of the city of Khadera stuck out like a sore thumb. That's how I came to give this lecture about his life and achievements. Doing the research and writing the lecture has been a fascinating experience. Among other things, it showed me my own prejudices. I hope you'll be as fascinated as I was. Moshe Mordechai Epstein was born on the 20th of Adar 5626 which corresponds to the 13th of March, 1866, in a small town called Baksh, a shtetl north of Vilna. He was the child of Rabbi Tzvi Chaim Epstein, the rabbi of Baksh, and his wife, Bela Hanna Epstein. Like his more famous son, Rabbi Tzvi Chaim was recognized as a powerful mind while still a student, and was known as the Baksh de Gaon, meaning the genius from Baksh. As a boy, Moshe Mordechai was recognized as being an exceptional genius and acquired the nickname the Baxter, the Baxter Iloi. An Iloi, that's a Yiddish word, meaning a young, highly intelligent youth with an extraordinary memory for religious texts and learning. By the age of 15, he had already demonstrated his total familiarity with half of Shas, 
that is half of the entire Talmud, half of the entire Gemara, complete with most of the important commentaries, old and new. At the age of 18, he was admitted to the Volozhin Yeshiva, which enjoyed worldwide fame, and still does, based as it is now in Yerushalayim, I think. By the age of 18, he was what Yiddish speakers call a Boki Pashas. In other words, he was totally familiar with the entire Talmud. At that time, the Rosh Hashiva of Volozhin was the famous Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik, author of Nefesh HaChayim, and grandfather of the famous Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, Yosef Donver Soloveitchik, of Yeshiva University in New York. At Volozhin, the young Moshe Mordechai became friendly with the equally young and exceptional Issa Zalman Meltzer, another Torah genius. He had started his learning career at the famous Mir Yeshiva, and at the age of 14 found his way to Volozhin. Both were typical of the Haredim of that age. Pious, devoted to their studies of Talmud and other Jewish religious books. Contrary to modern perceptions, the love of the Holy Land and Sion from afar was as common among the Haredim of that time as it had been ever since the destruction of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem and its temple, and as it still is, though the media hide that fact. Both Epstein and Meltzer shared that love, and together they joined an underground Zionist society called Nes Siona, which was part of the Chobabe Tzion movement, one of the founders of which was the poet Chaim Nachman Bialik. In his autobiography, the former chief rabbi Shlomo Goren writes, writes about Nes Siona and recalls that to become a member, the candidate for membership had to undertake to do three things. They had to make Aliyah, i.e. come to live in the Holy Land. They had to buy land here, and they had to settle on that land. As we will hear, Rabbi Epstein certainly achieved two of those objectives, and probably achieved the third, but for his untimely death. Later, as we will hear, the two friends, Epstein and Meltzer, married two sisters, daughters of a man named Schreigenfeibel Frank, a wealthy businessman who, before his death at the age of only 43, endowed each of his daughters with a substantial dowry. Rabbi Epstein married Menucha Frank, that we know, but the date of that marriage is a mystery, to me at least. One source says it was in 1896, but that cannot be correct. Others say it was 1889, but that seems also to be unlikely, though possible. Whenever it was, on his marriage, he moved from the lodging to Kovno, his wife's hometown, where he studied under the famous master of Musar, Rav Yitzchok Blaza. A year or two later, Rav, I should say Rabbi, I suppose, Issa Zalman Meltzer married Bela Hinderfrank. The couple joined the Epsteins in Kovno, and the two men resumed learning together. In 1893 or 1894, both were appointed teachers at the Slobodka Yeshiva, not far from Kovno. This was a major step for them both, because the Slobodka Yeshiva was renowned throughout the Jewish world. Very shortly after, in 1894, they were appointed joint Russia Yeshiva of the Slobodka Yeshiva, a tremendous honor, as I've said, this was the center of the Torah world in Lithuania, and Epstein was only 28. The Mashkiach Ruchni of Slobodka Yeshiva at the time was the famous Rab Rabbi Nossin Svi Finkel, who was widely known as Der Alta, that's Yiddish for the old man. And if I refer to Der Alta in the course of uh, what I have to say, I'm referring to what I think. Oh, can we have to start this mic, please? There we are. This is a picture of Der Alta, Reb Nossensee Finkel, years later, as you will see from the color of his beard. 
Mr. Zalman Meltzer left after a short time because he accepted an appointment as the Rosh Yeshiva of the Slutsk Yeshiva, leaving Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein, the sole Rosh Yeshiva of Slobodka. From then on, Epstein and Meltzer went their separate ways, though they remained close friends as well as brothers-in-law. Under Rabbi Nossin Svi Finkel and Moshe Mordechai Epstein, the Slobodka Yeshiva became even more highly respected because of the quality of the rabbis and scholars it was producing. Rabbi Epstein worked tirelessly for the good of the yeshiva and refused very many offers of very prestigious posts because he couldn't find anyone he deemed suitable to take over from him. Instead, he worked towards funding the construction of a new building. In 1900, the new building was ready and they moved in. It was a vast improvement on the former cramped building. Here it is, the new building as it was then in 1900. Controversy reared its head even in these new ideal surroundings. I mentioned twice, I think, that Mashiach Ruchni of the Yeshiva in Slobodka was a Nosset Sri Finkel. He had been one of the foremost pupils of Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, founder of the Musa movement, and Slobodka Yeshiva was part of that movement. In the yeshiva of the Musa movement, there were regular shiurim devoted to the study of the great works of Musa. Such a shir might be a daily event, or perhaps might be given two or three times a week. The accent in those shiurim was on ethics and morals in the everyday life of the individual Jew, on the basis that the study of Musa produced better rabbis and better Jews. Nobody questioned the value of such studies or books of Musa, but the traditionalists thought that the time thus occupied could be better spent on straightforward Gemara, rather than being, as they said, wasted on Musa. Until they came on Aliyah in 1924, Rabnosan Sri Finkel and Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein were much involved in the dispute, which continued until the Holocaust when most of the great rabbis conducting it were wiped out, along with the overwhelming majority of Lithuanian Jews. This dispute split the Slobodka Yeshiva, and Rabbi Finkel and Rabbi Epstein moved out and started their own yeshiva, which they called Knesset Yisrael. The majority of the students and some staff went with them. The great supporter of the yeshiva, a very wealthy Lithuanian Jew named Lachman, was persuaded by the opponents of Musa to withdraw his support for the new yeshiva, which meant that Rabbi Epstein had to spend much more of his time raising the funds to keep the yeshiva functioning. Eventually, mostly through his efforts, peace was restored and the two yeshivot reunited. I've got ahead of myself, and I now return to the year 1914 and the outbreak of the First World War. With the outbreak of war, most yeshivot in Lithuania were shut down immediately, and by Tisha B'Av in 5674, August the 2nd of 1914, the Jews of Kovno and its suburbs, including Sablonka, were ordered to leave the city because it was close to the front. The students and staff of the Slobodki Yeshiva were dispersed. Those under the age of being drafted into the army went home. The older boys went into hiding. Their altar, Rabnossi Svi Finkel, was arrested at a health spa in Germany. Moshe Mordechai Epstein fled to his daughter's home in a place called Rechista. There, he resolved to get the Yeshiva going again and decided to do so in Minsk. He wrote to all the staff and students, and they gradually found their way to Minsk. As soon as they started to arrive, he set up a Bet Medrash in one of the city's shuls, and they were fed by the tag system, eating tag. They received meals, in other words, in the homes of the local Jewish population. 
Bob, I think, will rejoin them when he was able to do so. And learning went on throughout the war. They made one more move during this war period to Kremenchug, which is in the K Ukraine. And then in 1919, they returned to Slobodka. The story of their travels, I have to tell you, could on its own provide material for a whole lecture. Back in its former home, the yeshiva prospered and its pupils continued to provide the cream of rabbis who were appointed to plumb rabbinic positions all over the world. Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein was one of the founders of the Organization of Rabbis in Lithuania and received and answered a constant flow of she'elot and questions from all over the Jewish world. Much later, one volume of his series of books was devoted to such she'elot of Teshuvot, in Yiddish Shalas and Teshuvas, and was published posthumously in 1946. <laughs> In 1923, he attended the Knesset Gedola, Gedola of Aguda Sisoil in Vienna and was one of the prominent speakers. He was elected to the World Rabbinical Council. A year later, in 1924, Moshe Mordechai Epstein and the Alter, Rabbi Nelson Tzvi Finkel, astonished the world by moving to the Holy Land, taking with them most of the staff and pupils of the Slobodka Yeshiva. Actually, it ought not to have been such a surprise. The Lithuanian government had resolved to start drafting Yeshiva Bachelin, students of the Yeshivot in that country, into their armed forces. But Moshe Mordechai Epstein and Nossen Svi Finkel moved faster than they did and removed most of their students and staff from the threat by emigrating en masse. For their new home, Rabbi Epstein chose the city of Hebron. Hebron, for those who use English names for foreign cities. Hebron was, of course, at the very heart of Jewish history in the Holy Land. It was always the second most holy city in the country second to Jerusalem to Jerusalem. The others were Tzafat, Safed in English, and Tiberia, Tiberius. Hebron contains the Oras HaMachpela, the Cave of Machpela, which had been purchased at an exorbitant price by Abraham Avinu, our patriarch Abraham, to serve as a burial place for his wife, Sarah. Sarah. Later it was used to bury Abraham himself, his son Yitzchak, Isaac, and his wife Rivka, Rebecca, and later still Abraham, the grandson, Yaakov, Jacob, and his first wife, Leah. Later in history, Hebron served as the first capital of King David's kingdom for several years until he conquered Jerusalem and moved his capital, capital there. Another, another important piece of history that is these days ignored because it's in political inconvenient, is the fact that throughout the post-biblical history of the Holy Land, there were virtually always Jews living in Hebron, with only a very few short interruptions, generally occurring because the local Jews had been massacred, massacred by some army or other. Until the events of 1929, of which more later, Many elderly religious Jews over the centuries went there to spend the closing years of their lives and then to be buried there. To return to our story, the Slobodka Yeshiva, now renamed Knesset Yisrael or Knesset Yisrael, did well in its new surroundings. For five years, it was a tremendous success story. However, in the Holy Land generally, things were going less and less smoothly. And this led to a big and sudden change in the atmosphere in the city of Hebron. An important figure in the development of that changed atmosphere was a powerful Muslim cleric named Hajj Amin al Husseini. Slide six,
There he is, there he is. By various nefarious means, this unpleasant man attained the title of Grand Mufti in Jerusalem, in which capacity he exercised an enormous malign influence over the Arab inhabitants of the Holy Land. He always hated the Jews. During World War II, he devoted himself to trying to help the Nazis take over the Middle East. He was an enthusiastic supporter of the idea of killing Jews in death camps and tried to get help, to get help Hitler to establish such camps in the Middle East. And here they are together. This is an interesting slide. You can see Hadjanin towards the right of the center of the picture with that unique hat. And he is about to enter a con German concentration camp. The gentleman on our right of him in the black uniform coat and cap carrying a staff is the famous notorious Heinrich Him Himmler. Unfortunately, he was very successful in persuading the Arab world to hate and, if possible, kill the Jews. Long before these pictures were taken, in the summer of 1929, his campaign of incitement in Hebron reached its climax. Late on the night of the 16th of Av, 5689, which was a Thursday, the 22nd of August, 1929, Arab mobs attacked the Jewish community in Hebron. One of their prime targets was the yeshiva, where the students were mostly asleep in their beds when they were attacked. The Arab mob invaded the yeshiva in large numbers, armed with butchers' knives and choppers, and some larger hatchets and axes, and set about them, inflicting terrible wounds. They also attacked many Jews in their homes. Many of the 68 people who were killed were killed outright, but more than 60 people needed hospital treatment. 24 of the 68 dead were students or teachers at the yeshiva. Many of the wounded lost limbs, hands, feet, arms and legs were brutally amputated. This slide shows murdered members, hard to believe it, members of one family that was wiped out, all of them. The next slide, please. This next slide, bad picture, but you can see it, is a man being dressed, he's having his arm dressed and treated by a nurse. And as you can see, his hand has been taken clean off, leaving a stump that the hospital is trying to tidy up. There were horrific head injuries. Slide number, the next slide shows a young woman with a head wound. I say young woman, she looks more like a girl than a woman, but there you go, I don't know how old she was. And the next slide shows a family that survived, though all were wounded, father, mother and child. All of them with head injuries, father with more injuries, as you can see, he's sitting down because he can't stand up and his wife with her arm in a cast. You can see they've all had a bad time. If ever you go to Hebron, visit the Jewish Museum there. There are many, many photographs there of victims who survived the attacks on them. They are mute testimony to the ferocity of their attackers. Before I go to the next slide, some of you may prefer not to look, to look away because they show, it shows some of the dead as they were found after the massacre. There it is, not a very nice picture. We'll go straight away from that. As one might expect of the early 20th century, there is no published report of what happened to the women and girls who were not wounded or killed outright. But it is hard to imagine an Arab mob incited by Hajj Amin al Husseini not engaging in rape. The British army eventually woke up 
and came to the rescue of the surviving Jews, evacuating the wounded to hospitals in Jerusalem. That night, and during the following days and nights, the yeshiva, Jewish homes, and the synagogues and Jewish communal buildings were looted and ruined, and many were set on fire. This is a picture of an ancient synagogue with Anna. Notice the Arab Kodesh, it's on the left. Its doors are open, the contents have been removed and desecrated. If you look at the bottom of the picture, you can see at the foot of the stairs, to the right of whatever it is that was striped, it may have been the cover of the uh, Shulchan or something like that, a, what looks like a section of a Sefer Torah. It's been torn out of one of the holy Sifre Torah in the Arab Kodesh. This picture looks to me as if it may be the Abraham Avinu synagogue, but I may be wrong. The next slide shows a different ancient synagogue where the damage is even more excessive, I'm tempted to say outrageous. The next slide shows a room in the Jewish home. That was somebody's, I don't even know what room it was. You can't tell. Maybe a dining room that looks like a table. I've no idea. Oh, it's probably a kitchen because there's pots in a sink. Open. So that's a Jewish kitchen. The Jewish cemetery was wrecked. Tombstones were broken and stolen for use in Arab homes. By some miracle, Rab Moshe Mordechai Epstein and his wife and his children escaped attack. Although he refused to leave the town until every Jew had escaped, he suffered a heart attack in the aftermath of the atrocities. There was a mass funeral of many of the dead in Jerusalem under British security. The next slide shows part of the mass funeral. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's the second room. No, next one, please. There we are. If you look carefully, you'll see that in the front, as it is now to our picture, the first set you can see is two stretches side by side. And that was the pattern, I think, through the funeral. Behind there, I think, also two stretches. They look like one, but I think there were two side by side. And the angle that the people in front of them is confusing. It was a mass funeral. And within days after that, the British had evacuated all the surviving Jews to Jerusalem, and Hebron was left with no Jewish inhabitants until the Six Day War in 1967. That is what most of the books say, and what most of us have always believed. But actually, one Jew did remain for many years protected by Arabs who thought that, as a fifth-generation resident of the city, he ought to be an exception. But even he left in 1947, at the time of the United Nations Resolution on Partition of the Land. Shortly after the massacre, the yeshiva re-established itself in borrowed premises in Jerusalem, and soon those who were able were again engaged in their holy studies. Moshe Mordechai Epstein himself never forgot the events of the pogrom. He gave a Hesper, a memorial address, at a gathering to mark the first anniversary of the massacre. And at, in the course of that, he wept openly, blaming himself for the blood that had been spilled, having brought the yeshiva to Hebron rather than to Jerusalem. And three years later, he was dead. Years afterwards, the yeshiva moved into a new purpose-built building in Geula, the Geula area of Jerusalem, which is still called the Hebron Yeshiva Building. And here it is. This is the Hebron Yeshiva Building in Geula, Yerushalayim. In 1975, the yeshiva made what seems to have been its final move to give up Mordechai, and there it stayed. Back to our chronology. During the Great Depression that started in the autumn of 1929, Rabbi Epstein was constantly struggling to raise the money needed to keep the yeshiva afloat. He wrote large number of letters, large numbers of letters, some of which I have seen, begging for money. And he traveled several times 
to the USA and to Europe to raise funds to keep the yeshiva going. This is a picture of him, looking now rather older, during a 1924 visit to New York. He was there again in 1927. He may have been there on many more times, but I just don't know. Excellent. This is Epstein again with some local dignitaries joining one of those visits to the United States. And the next slide, if we can have it, shows him joining one of, joining a later trip abroad. I don't know where it's taken. He had a difficult time, but he succeeded. And the success, story, the success story of the yeshiva continued despite the depression. There can be no doubt that its survival during these difficult years was in no small measure due to the unremitting efforts of Moshe Mordechai Epstein, who labored under enormous pressure to throughout, uh, throughout. To complete the story of his life, Epstein and his wife had six daughters and one son. He wrote a number of volumes using the title Levush Mordechai, which contained his own insights on the entire Talmud. The first volume, on Baba Kama was published in 1901 and is particularly renowned. I've already mentioned at least one of his other volumes containing many of his Sha'elot and Tushuvot, Silas and Shubas. He also wrote volumes on the Yoradea and Choshen Mishpat sections of the Shulchan Aruch. If I haven't said so, there were volumes on it, the whole of the Talmud. The pace of his personal learning was unbelievable. Every month he revised the whole of the Mishnah. Once living in his country, he revised daily as many as 45 to 50 dafim of Gemara, that is folios, two, two sides of every page. Each pair of sides is a daf. So as to go through the whole of Shas, i.e. the whole of Talmud, each year. At the same time, he was revising each year the two of the orders of Shulchan Aruch, Yoredea and Choshen Mishpah. He died in Jerusalem on the 28th of November 1933, the 10th of Kislev, 5694, and was buried on Haraz 18, the Mount of Olives. Now I've come to what I expect you've been waiting for, the event to some events many years earlier, in fact, the years around 1890. At this point, I must acknowledge the help I received from, it, from Ronit Yarden, the archivist at the Khan Museum in Khadera, a place incidentally well worth a visit. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to watch this presentation, though I hope she will see a recording in due course. In the middle of COVID restrictions, I contacted her on the phone out of the blue, and she was a real fount of information. At the start of our conversation, I mentioned the name of Rav Mordechai, Moshe Mordechai Epstein, and she was very excited to hear from someone researching the history of this, to her, mysterious rabbi. She recognized the name, as I say. The information she gave me was fascinating, because although it matched the story and the sources in outline, she provided many details. Eventually, she even provided me with a historic photograph, as well as copies of many documents in the museum's archives. I must also recall my thanks to Khaled Selet Weber, who spent some hours helping me decipher the documents. During that original conversation with Ronit, I said I had heard of Rabbi Epstein's visit to Khadera in 1889, and Ronit promptly corrected me, saying it was in fact in 1890. In that year, 1890, a mission came here from Kovno. It was backed by Chomovei Tzion members in several other Lithuanian Jewish communities. Their objective was to look on behalf of the Lithuanian Jewish community into how funds sent to support the Jews from Eastern Europe were being spent. Ronit told me that the 24-year-old Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein was one of the members of the mission. 
This is the historic photograph in the possession in the possession of the museum. Slide. It is a slide that shows four individuals posed in tarbushes, the uh, the Turkish headgear, on the 1890 mission from Lithuania. The names were Botkovsky, Schetzer, Gofnovich, and Epstein. Epstein being Moshe Mordechai Epstein, and I believe he must be the tall man standing at the back, second from the right. I had read that both Rab Epstein's brother-in-law, Rabbi Issa Zalman Meltzer, and their father-in-law, Schrag and Fabel Frank, were part of the mission, but neither they nor their names are on the photograph. One possibility, which from it the archive, archivist conceded, is that there may have been more delegates on the mission, delegates on the mission. But the other more likely possibility is that there was more than one such visit. Anyway, this mission went first to Jerusalem and made their inquiries there. And it was while they were doing that that they heard about plans to start a new settlement in the Sharon, south of Caesarea, Caesarea. They traveled to the end. <coughs> Excuse me. They traveled to the area and found a large malarial swamp in part of which it was intended to create the new settlement of Cadera. The mission arrived at a crucial moment and took part in the deliberations of the group of Jews who had devised the plan with the help of the famous or perhaps notorious Yehoshua Henkin, they negotiated the purchase of the land. More about that in a moment. Finally, there took place an historic meeting at which those present passed a resolution to find a Moshava, a settlement in the area to be called Khadera. Among those who signed the resolution were the four members of the Kovno mission in this photograph, including Moshe Mordechai Epstein. And that is part of the reason why in Khadera to this day he is honored as having been one of the founders of the city. The archivist Ronick told me that many of those at the, beat, at the meeting also committed themselves to buying plots of land. In fact, one report I've seen says that the members of the mission contracted to purchase the land on which Hadera would be built. In other words, all of it. The reality is that talk of plots of land was nonsense. They were looking at swamp land alive with mosquitoes and other vermin, such as venomous snakes. The only inhabitants of any size were a handful of water buffaloes. There were virtually no really dry spots where the settlers could live while setting up their settlement. The swamps would have to be drained before anything else could be done. The whole prospect seemed to be pie in the sky. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words so here are a few pictures of the Sharon swamps, though not in the Hadera area. This is a view of a woman in a typical swamp. I think that must be in the Sharon with the southern end of the Kalma range on the horizon, forming the horizon behind her. The next slide is more typical of what the settlers face. If any of you want a teal, you can trace, there is a place to the north of Latania, but south of um, Haifa, where there is a piece of land kept in the state as a swamp, though it's far less wild than it would be at, this, at the time we're talking about. It's been kept in that state to give an illustration of what it was that the settlers faced. This is typical of what they faced, and it's fairly typical of the site that we visited. Next slide, we will. This is a later project with a drainage project far more advanced. You can see the date on the bottom, the 1920s, it says. And the next slide, slide shows an even later stage in the drainage project. Only last week, I found a magazine article from a few years 
ago about the purchase, and I want to quote from it. Henkin had promised the Khorovetsion delegation that he would have the swamps drained, but he reneged on this obligation and seized their down payment and the deeds to the property. Rabbi Rav, it says, Rav Moshe Mordechai was forced into protracted negotiations before finally obtaining control of the land. The colony was named Khadera, and the city to this very day commemorates Rav Epstein's role in its founding with a photo display in the municipal offices showing him and his fellow delegates adorned with Ottoman tarbushes on their 1890 trip. These efforts explain many of the letters from the museum archives that I had seen. They were side effects of the dispute with Henkin. The photo display mentioned in the extract I just read is the slide I just displayed. Here it is again. Both Epstein and Meltzer, the two rabbis, had received substantial dowries when they married two of the Frank sisters, and the two of them contracted to use most, if not all, of those funds to purchase jointly for themselves a parcel of land in the new settlement. They decided to make it into an etrog orchard. You know, the etrog that we use on Sukkot was part of the four species. They were going to plant the trees that produce etrogim. Trees like that actually need a lot of water, so it wasn't completely stupid. But the whole venture was typical of the sort of blind optimism and determination that built the state of Israel. Just a single statistic, within two years, more than half of the 260 or so original settlers had died of malaria. That is a sobering truth of the early settlements in the Sharon where we live, the huge cost in human life and suffering. We must never forget that. Rabbi Epstein, as I've said, eventually succeeded in getting the documents of title to the land, and his role in getting hold of them may be the other reason why he is so highly regarded by those memorializing these things in Chadera. Research into a topic like this is always a, an endless task. There is always something else to discover. I started working on the lecture a couple of months ago, nearly. By last Friday, I thought I'd finished it, and that all remained was to tidy up the text and do a bit of editing. On Monday, more, on Monday evening, after a shear, an online shear that I watched, I went looking online for some information about a rabbi who'd been mentioned in the shear. I found and read a short biography of him in Wikipedia. In the footnotes, I found a link to a PhD thesis on the subject of the Slobodki Yeshiva and its emigration and establishment in Mandate Palestine. I couldn't get it on the screen. It's in the hands of an, organ an organization, and it was going to take a lot of time to go through the procedures too late before this lecture for me to go through the procedures required for me to get hold of the text of the thesis and read it, let alone to assimilate its contents and fit them into this lecture. So I'm sorry, but that's all I can usefully tell you. But we all now know not only that there is more information out there to be found, but it may be highly relevant. Too bad. I return to my starting point about the commonly held view that all Haredim are anti-Zionist. It wasn't true in history, it wasn't true in the early days of Zionism, and it isn't true today. Beware the media. They have an agenda. If you have been, thank you for listening. We'll see if there are any questions in the uh, Okay, first of all, um, Melissa has to unmute everybody, try and stop the kids shouting behind you or whatever, but uh, she's going to unmute everybody so that you can talk, and we'll see who's got questions to be answered. Can you see anybody on the, is there anyone in the chat? Well, nobody's written any questions on the chat. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Certainly. All right. I noticed the, the change in, in, in his hat wear, his headwear over the years. 
Spoda to uh, what else was he wearing? I don't know. He obviously went through different phases where, where he was. Not, not a very deep question, but it's one an observation. Yes. Well, it's true. And if you go think about what you see in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, you will see far more spodex and stramels in Jerusalem, or mm -hmm. even in Kiryat Sands, than you will see in London. They exist, but not many people wear them. And that's the case all over the continent. There are a lot of Jews around who will have a stramel or a spodex, will put it on in the house for kiddish and benching and whatever, eating and benching, for the Seder. But they won't wear it, they don't all wear them in the street. So, sorry, your voice, you vanished. I can't hear you, I'm afraid. I think you may still be muted. We're not hearing you, Elizabeth. You seem to be muted. Okay, okay, I've unmuted myself I've now. We've got you now. We've got yeah. you now. When he was in New York, he wear, he's wearing a top hat. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. And I, I would guess that was suggested by those whom he was approaching first, who said, if you want to get anywhere in this city, <laughs> you wear a top hat and not a spotty. And I'm that's quite right. sure that's the advice he was given, and he was probably given a top hat. And in the last of the three pictures, he's actually wearing, I think, an ordinary trilby hat. Trilby, um, yeah. And again, it's because of what he was told. People in this city, he will be told, people in New York do not wear Swadets and Strabbles when they collect mm -hmm. money, when they're going around the business areas. It's yeah. looking for trouble and looking for people being embarrassed and not giving them money and so forth and so on. So, good question, but the answer is very simple, human psychology. He himself, mm -hmm. at home, would wear his Swadek proudly. So, very good. Can I ask you a question? Whether that is, yes. Can, uh, we see? Hank can I ask you a question? Oh, Hank, Hank Citron. Hello. Hank Citron. Enjoyed your yeah. lecture very much. Translated into American time, so I knew what time to, to see you. Nice seeing you all. Uh, and they do not wear top hats in, in Wall Street. You're absolutely correct. Uh, my question is, are there any living descendants of his who are active in the rabbinic world today that you ran into? Well, let's start with the first generation. When he left, he left a number of daughters, you'll remember, six daughters. They had six daughters and a son. And when he left um, Slobodka, they had to replace him. I've forgotten the name of the, no, I haven't. Rabbi Yitzchok Isaac Scher was the Rosh Hashiva after he left. But it may have been preceded by a rabbi called Sana, and I've forgotten his first name, who um, was Rabbi Epstein's son-in-law. So in, in Israel, were there any descendants of his who were active in the rabbinic world? I don't know. I suspect there were. I suspect that even if they weren't, if they survived the war, then they would have found their way to Israel. But I don't actually know. Um, they wouldn't be called Epstein, that's the trouble. Yeah. The son was called Epstein, and I think he, I'm not sure, he may have gone in the Holocaust, may have lost, been lost in the Holocaust. But the others would not be called Epstein. Son, as I say, is the name of one descendant of his through his daughter. Um, and he was quite a well known rabbi of Rosh Hashiva. Uh, I'm not sure that's a full answer to your question, but that's all I can tell you. Thank you for an excellent lecture. I enjoyed it very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? No? Well, then, Sippy, you better call a close to the meeting. No, I have a question. Uh, oh. Clear, it's Mitch. Um, so so are, there, are there any particular Sephorin for which in, like, the contemporary Orthodox Jewish world um, that he wrote that are regarded as like um, important sources that are studied um, in, in today's world? I fear I may have been regarded as exaggerated because what I said in terms was 
he was one of the leading rabbinical authorities of his lifetime. And some people say he was one of the leading rabbinic, not rabbinical, I'm sorry, Talmud, Talmudist authorities of the 20th century. That's one name, one description of him that I've been given. So he was certainly well known. His Sephorim, his commentaries on the whole of the Talmud, I don't know if they're still in print. I, I, not sure but certainly there were a lot of copies knocking about and if you go to a local a good local colo library like for instance the colo library in kiliat sons they may very well be there i haven't looked um i'm sorry I've, no i'm just interested that was all yeah writing this lecture as it is yes. Ed, one you can be sure of is that his books are more called <laughs> In other words, his books on the Talmud are all called Levush Mordechai Bavakama, Levush Mordechai Bavamusi, oh, and then Levush Mordechai Shalos and Shuvas, Shalot and Tishuvas. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. And there is certainly, I believe that the original edition, I may have got this wrong, but I read somewhere the original edition was, I think, 11 books. But as I say, that, that this was at the beginning of the 1900s. The first one was published in 1901. And in 1946, the Charles and Teshuvas, the Elot and Teshuvot book, was published. So that was, what, 13 years after his death. Um, uh, whether, what is in print today, I don't know. Okay, thank you. All right, Sippy, would you like to have, have your cue? Okay, if Elizabeth wants to have a word, she can. Elizabeth? Okay, I'm wrapping up. All right, I forgot. <laughs> anyway, Leslie, I know you don't like long votes of thanks, so I'm not going to give you a long one, but it was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. You've done a lot of research as usual. And um, we look forward to hearing from you again, because I know you've got some others in your drawer already. And uh, thank you very, very much indeed. The next lecture for the library, I believe we have something in March. I'm not sure of the date, but you'll be notified. Watch this space. And thank you very much to everybody for, for tuning in. And it was fascinating. Thank you, Leslie, again. Well, thank you for thank me as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.